really exciting panel. It's going to be a, a fun conversation. Um, but I want to in introduce our panelists first so you get to know a little bit about them, and then um, Dan will kick off the conversation. Uh, so first we have uh, Jorge Perigoria, film director and producer of Los Jardines de la Reina, widely known as Pichi. We're very lucky to have him here. He's one of Latin America's great actors and directors, starring in over 50 films and series in Cuba and abroad. Pichi actually studied civil engineering until he turned to theater in 1984 and made the big leap to the uh, big screen in the 90s, achieving worldwide fame with his first feature film, Fresa y Chocolate, Strawberry and Chocolate, which was Oscar nominated for Best Foreign Film. More recently, he starred in the Netflix series, Four Seasons in Havana, and the Filmin series, Doctor Portuundo, and is currently working on projects in Cuba, Mexico, and Spain. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Jorge is also uh, uh, accompanied by his son, Adán Perregoria, uh, who is impressive in his own right. He's a professional pianist and an entrepreneur, uh, as well as a leader of uh, local development projects in Havana. Uh, Adán will be uh, helping with translation. We'll start the, Spani the conversation in Spanish and then, and then move to English. Um, we're also joined by Maggie Burnett Stogner, Professor of uh, Film and Media Arts with the School of Communication and Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Filmmaking here at American University. Maggie has over 30 years of filmmaking experience, including nine at National Geographic. Her most recent films include the award-winning Unbreathable, The Fight for Healthy Air. We're also joined by Tamara Figredo, who was featured in the film. She's an environmental economist with Avalon. Avalon's a pioneering tourism operator that supports the protection of the gardens of the Queen National Park and helped found it many years ago. She's worked on scientific projects and practically lives on a boat in the park and has been involved in the declaration of marine reserves all throughout the country. Also joining us from Havana is Yosiel Marrero. <laughs> uh, is an environmental engineer by training. He works for the Cuban environmental NGO, the Antonio Nunez Jimenez Foundation for Humankind and Nature, as the program director for responsible economics and consumption. His work links business, environmental sustainability, and art. Um, we're also joined by Julio Maz, technical coordinator for sustainable fisheries at Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, in Belize. Julio is a biologist and expert in marine conservation whose work helps protect the Belize Barrier Reef and supports conservation efforts across Mesoamerica and the Caribbean, including collaborations with Cuba. Uh, we also are joined by Maria Jose Espinosa. She's the executive director at the Center for Democracy in the Americas. Maria Jose has developed advocacy program and communication strategies that drive transformative action in US foreign policy toward Latin America on issues including Cuba, regional migration, and protections for refugees and migrants. We're also joined by Dr. Phil Brenner, who is a professor emeritus of international relations and history here at American University. Dr. Brenner has led extensive research and writing on U.S.-Cuba relations, U.S.-Latin American relations, and contemporary U.S. foreign policy. His most recent book is Cuba Libre, a 500-year quest for independence. And lastly, I want to introduce tonight's panel facilitator, my colleague, Dan Whittle, senior attorney and senior director of Caribbean initiatives at Environmental Defense Fund. Dan plays a leading role in projects that promote sustainable fisheries, marine conservation, and community-based clean energy and climate justice. Dan co-founded EDF's Cuba program and has been especially active in scientific exchange between the two countries and cooperation between the US and Cuba. Uh, and so we're just so excited to have this great group together tonight. Um, Dan's going to kick off the conversation, and um, we'll uh, get to hear from everybody's perspectives. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Great. Uh, thank you, Valerie, and thank you, everyone, for coming. A lot of familiar faces. We've got students, colleagues, scientists, uh, diplomats, friends, children. So thank you very much for coming. This is a wonderful film, and we're just so honored to be part of it. So we'll start uh, with Jorge, with Pichi. Um, I'll ask him a few questions in, in English and Spanish. Uh, I'm going to try uh, my Spanish briefly. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk to everyone else uh, on the panel. Uh, 
So Kichi, uh, I want to know what inspired you to do this film in the first place. ¿Qué te inspiró a crear esta película? Sí, hola. Primero, buenas noches. Gracias a todos por la, por la presencia acá. Eh, realmente es difícil en el mundo de hoy eh, no ser consciente de todas las consecuencias del cambio climático, del calentamiento global. Cada vez uno está más alarmado ¿no? con esta situación. Eh, pero realmente, eh, yo como actor... O sea, es muy común que actores, muchos actores y gente del mundo del cine, que es donde vengo yo, pues terminen involucrados en estas causas, ¿no? Y traten de contribuir de alguna manera eh, a esta causa del, del medio ambiente, ¿no? I'll translate quickly for Jorge. So he says, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Dan asked, you know, what inspired him to make this film? And he reflected on... Um, you know, being able to see climate change in real life and the causes and the effects that are happening now, um, you know, makes him think about nature. And as an actor, it's very common that uh, folks in his profession start to pay attention to environmental issues and different causes and try to do something to get involved and use the profession uh, to bring attention to these issues. Pero la, el, el arrancamos con este proyecto porque hace unos años, y volvemos al tema de siempre, que en el gobierno de Obama eh, ocurrió un momento de mucho intercambio entre Cuba y Estados Unidos y a través con un amigo mío que se llama Andrés Levín logramos eh, que nos dieran las licencias para TEDx hicimos dos años consecutivos la conferencia de TEDx Habana. Uh -huh. So this project really kicked off um, when Obama was president, and there was a lot of exchange between Cuba and the U.S., a really exciting time. And one of his friends, Andres Levin, um, happened to help him get the license to be able to host the TEDx series in Havana. So for two years, Jorge uh, hosted this series. Y en, en una de esas eh, conferencias eh, participó eh, Fabián Pina, el biólogo que aparece en el documental y, y yo me quedé fascinado con lo de Jardines de la Reina y con este proyecto del parque y los resultados y después quedé conversando con él y, y realmente yo dije, bueno, esto vamos a hacer algo porque esto la gente lo tiene que conocer y hace falta que la gente tome conciencia de las cosas que se pueden hacer ¿no? en ese sentido y así eh, surgió este proyecto por eso quiero... Eh, aprovechar la oportunidad y esta proyección agradecer, agradecerle a Fabián que es el compañero Tamara y, la, y, y a todos los científicos que aparecen en el documental del Centro de Investigación de Ecosistemas Costeros que fue otra cosa que me fascinó ver toda la gente de ciencia que hay en Cuba trabajando en el tema de la conversación que es algo que tampoco tiene visibilidad, que prácticamente no se conoce. No sé si hablé mucho. No, no, tengo buena memoria, no te preocupes, tengo buena memoria. So, <laughs> Ori was saying that during one of these TEDx talks, Fabian Pina, who he met, the biologist in the film, um, presented. You can actually see his talk on YouTube. And um, he spoke about Jardines de la Reina, and Pichi just was fascinated by uh, the park and Fabian and said we have to do something together uh, and you know the more he learned about the park he realized that working together they could kind of bring a lot more attention and, and consciousness to um, the success and all of the work that's happening there. Uh, he wants to take a moment to thank Fabian Pina for you know making this connection. Fabian is also the uh, uh, partner of Tamara so <laughs> she's here also on behalf of him as well um, and and for all you know, the doors that he opened up to, to start this project, through that connection, he got to know the scientist working at the Center for Coastal, um, the Center for Coastal Ecosystem Research, CIEC. Um, and it was another thing that fascinated him, seeing all of these scientists working together in the field, something that's really unknown um, throughout Cuba. You know, they work in an isolated place, and this work can help bring light to their collaboration. Uh, 
Sí. Uh, la película uh, combina el arte y la ciencia para transmitir un mensaje uh, urgente, creo, uh, con uh, esperanza también. Uh, ¿Puedes hablar un poco más sobre uh, tu papel como cineasta y artista al abordar los principales uh, problemas uh, ambientales? Uh, no es tiempo. Thank you, that's not <laughs> Eh, eh, bueno, realmente yo creo que, que como decía al principio, es, es ya casi como un compromiso moral con uno mismo. ¿Qué puede hacer uno, no? En esta lucha que es urgente, ¿no? Por, por, el, por el medio ambiente, ¿no? Y, y empezamos a hacer este documental. Eh, eso llevó una investigación, pero realmente yo... La idea que tuve desde el principio era como ponerme en la posición del espectador e ir descubriendo a través de los especialistas y de los científicos el trabajo de cada uno en este tema de conservación y los resultados de haber creado este parque natural en cifras que ellos mismos comentan, ¿no? la cantidad de tiburones, cómo se han conservado los corales. Entonces creo que así de alguna manera eh, el mensaje estaba más claro. ¿no? Y eso fue lo que, lo que hice. So Dan asked, um, you know, as, um, as an actor who was concerned about these issues, how did you tell a story that talks about serious environmental problems but also presents a sense of hope and, and brings those things together? And Peachy commented that, you know, he really feels like it's a, a moral responsibility that one has to be able to, to share this. And um, he approached the project um, from the perspective as a, of a, a spectator, somebody that was arriving to the park and getting to discover it, you know, little by little with all of the experts he met along the way, um, and really letting them tell their stories. Uh, you know, what, what, how do they do their work on their own? You saw it with the data. How do they present the results so that they can really share the story? Nadar con tiburones, ¿verdad? Eso estuvo difícil. Realmente yo, yo siempre he tenido una relación, de hecho he vivido en el mar casi la mitad de mi vida y, y tener una relación con el mar y con... pero de respeto a los tiburones, porque uno siempre tiene prejuicio, ¿no? Pero ustedes vieron a Noel, ese buzo y fotógrafo que sale ahí, que es un hombre que tiene una relación con los tiburones extraordinaria. Y a pesar de que yo iba consciente de que tenía que bañarme con los tiburones cuando estaba a punto de tirarme, que yo vi que eso estaba lleno de tiburones, yo dije, wow, donde me he metido, ¿no? Pero ahí ya tú estás al frente de un equipo y ya no puedes echar para atrás, tienes que ir para adelante. Y, y me sentía protegido realmente con todos los, los biólogos, los bus. Y, y fue una experiencia, como yo reconozco, transformadora, porque de verdad que está fallándote con los tiburones eh, y, y, y de, es una cosa de energía ahí, de, de que te transforma la percepción que tienes de ellos, ¿no? Eh, y es, es más, una experiencia maravillosa, realmente. Y no solo una, es una experiencia maravillosa, sino también pensando en el destino, o sea, pensando... En lo, en, en lo que está ocurriendo con la que prácticamente están acabando con los tiburones, que las cifras se dicen en el documental en todas partes del mundo, esto es una manera eh, realmente muy especial de ayudar a salvar la especie y también sirve para, 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 para el turismo, para el desarrollo, ¿no? para, yo creo que como, como hemos estado hablando en estos días, eh, Conservar vivos estos tiburones por muchos años eh, genera más recursos que, que matarlos para quitarle la aleta y, y comercializarlo, ¿no? Entonces, realmente vale la pena todo este trabajo de conservación y el trabajo que hacen todos todo estos científicos. So, Dan asked, did you really swim with sharks? <laughs> And PG <Pichy> said, <laughs> no, está bien, no preocupes. Uh, he said it was really hard, <laughs> but, but he did it. He really did. He said when they got to the site, 
you know, he, he has already a relationship with the ocean. He's lived his whole life by the sea. But when you get there on the boat and you look out and you see the sharks swimming there, you start to think, what have I gotten myself into? And, um, but you can't, you can't go back then. You know, everybody's ready for you to, to dive with the sharks. So he did. He jumped in. And um, once he was in, he, he felt protected. You know, he had all the biologists there with him. And you start to feel comfortable. Um, and that it, for him, it really was a transformative experience to change how he thought about sharks and the ocean and, and your connection. Um, and, you know, the more that he thought about and kind of had this feeling of uh, swimming with the sharks, uh, he realized how valuable the con conservation efforts are. You know, they shared the stats about uh, how much more valuable a shark is in the ocean, if it's uh, um, you know part of a scuba scuba diving tourism uh, program rather than being fished, and so uh, it really brings to life how important this conservation effort is. ¿Qué sigue? Bueno, <laughs> eh, sí, eh, realmente cuando uno empieza, yo mi primera experiencia como tal. Vaya, para decirlo claro, militando ya en esto del medio ambiente, ya, sintiéndome que estoy haciendo cosas, fue este documental. Después también le he puesto la voz a un documental que hicieron un, un equipo irlandés en, en Cuba sobre medio ambiente también, en español, o sea, como actor, hice el doblaje al español, la narración al español. Y ahora, cada vez me he estado entusiasmando más con este tema, eh, cada vez he, he, he tomado conciencia de la importancia de este tema y ahora hemos decidido, tenemos un equipo en lo cual forma parte Adán, eh, Josiel, forma parte EDF ¿no? también, que es fundar un festival de cine y medio ambiente en la isla de la juventud en Cuba. Y eso es algo que nos tiene ilusionado a todos por la importancia que puede tener ese Festival Internacional de Cine y Medio Ambiente para la Isla de Cuba, para la Isla de la Juventud y para el Caribe también. Eh, y, y estamos trabajando en eso, a ver si en, en las fechas de mayo podemos hacerlo por primera vez. Iniciar este otro ciclo que va a formar parte ya también de mi trabajo y de mi vida, porque yo, estoy, yo presido un festival de cine en Cuba, que se llama Festival Internacional de Gibara, y prácticamente lo voy a dejar por el decir medio ambiente. <laughs> This is uh, really big news. So Dan said, what's next? And um, Peachy explained, you know, after kicking off this uh, environmental film, he's just become more involved. He narrated a, another environmental film that was directed by um, a team from Ireland. And... Um, Now he's on to a new exciting vision. Uh, he's starting um, a new environmental film festival in Cuba in the Isle of Youth. Uh, he's put together a team that includes Adan, uh, Yosiel, uh, EDF, um, and many others who are kicking off this process. Hopefully next May, um, they will host the first environmental film festival on the Isle of Youth. And um, he sees this as... Uh, a way to transform development and cultural experiences on the Isle of Youth. For many years, he's led a, a, another environmental film festival, the, uh, sorry, another film festival, the Hibara International Film Festival in Cuba. And um, he's going to pass that on and let others direct it and really dedicate his time to this new environmental film festival and, and make it a key part of his life moving forward. Sí, pero... Eh, <risa> no, que, eh, lo, lo otro que quería agregar es que, bueno, eh, esta experiencia del Festival de Gibara fue una experiencia también que me enriqueció mucho como, como ser humano, como persona, ¿no? En creer como un proyecto cultural puede transformar una localidad. Entonces, voy a dejar mi vara, pero me llevo esa experiencia para aplicarla en la Isla de la Juventud. En este caso, un proyecto ligado al medio ambiente eh, que vamos a aplicar en la isla. Es un proyecto de desarrollo local 
donde el festival va a ser una parte de este proyecto, donde queremos eh, eh, convertir la isla en una isla verde, eh, con energías renovables, sustentables, donde queremos eh, aplicar la agricultura orgánica y que el festival sea también lo que le dé visibilidad a este proyecto ¿no? de, que tenemos en la Isla de la Juventud, de lo cual también pudieran hablar un poco Josiel y, y Abad. So, Pichi wanted to add that um, this vision for the film festival is really based from his experience in the Hibata International Film Festival, where he saw um, the power of this type of cultural experience to transform a community. And so, while he's stepping away from that film festival, he's carrying that experience with him to the Isle of Youth, and he sees this film festival as part of a larger local development project that will hopefully transform the island into a green island that includes renewable energy product, uh, projects um, uh, and other types of green initiatives that involve the community and focus on not just a one-time event, but a whole ongoing project in sustainable development. That, that's a really big deal. And you know, when Chi-Chi said, I want to do this festival, uh, he looked at us and said, you know, are you guys on board? And we said, yeah. So it's very exciting. It's a big, big undertaking. So we're excited to do it with them. Uh, I want to turn to Maggie. And um, I think we've just seen the power of film uh, to, to convey uh, urgency and hope. And we've also seen the power of film transform the filmmaker uh, and, and really create a mission for PT. And so it's very, very exciting. So Maggie, based on your experience, many, many years as a filmmaker, as a professor, what do you think are the key elements of making a film that, is, that creates such inspiration, that inspires action and environmentalism? Well, uh, first, let me just say um, congratulations to the filmmakers. Thank you. Uh, really, um, extraordinary film. And, and thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, on behalf of the American University of School of Communication and the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of this amazing panel and um, part of this just interchange um, culturally and, and to be able to see such an extraordinary film. And you asked that question and I could answer a lot of generalities, but I want to be more specific. There was a phrase in this film that I think we can all relate to, and that is that we are prisoners of our own experience. And I think that that is something that film um, addresses very clearly that we can use film to transport ourselves, to transport audiences, to transport others to places we would never see, that we would never experience. And this film did that so effectively, not only in taking us into a world that most of us will probably never ever get to see, uh, but also in, in engaging our, our intellect and our curiosity with a, you know, really interesting information that we probably didn't know, and engaging our heart, which is where film really resonates in being able to connect us with worlds we don't know about, with people we don't know about, so that we can expand our, our experience. And I, I really want to say congratulations again to the filmmakers for providing that, because I think it's rare to be able to see something that um, you can't just find on Netflix. I hope this film gets distributed many, many places. Thank you, Maggie. What, I think you kind of said this already, but what advice do you have for young people in the audience, students who, who might be drawn to the film uh, as a way of, of uh, doing well, environmental Where do I start? Yeah. <laughs> um, how long do you have? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, now, I, I really think we're at a stage right now with environmental filmmaking where there is an urgency. We have a climate crisis bearing down on us. Yeah. And we have to find ways to use film to really engage people, to activate people, to motivate people. And it's not a little do, although that does create a sense of urgency, makes us kind of stressed out, right? But it's about providing ways to act, ways to engage, and providing hope in that sense of there are things we can do that bring us together. And one of the things that I encourage filmmakers to do is think about what, what, why are you making the film that you're making? What is motivating you to do that? How can you use that film 
to engage people and to get them to um, take action. And perhaps most importantly of all, and particularly in this time frame that we've been living in, is how can you use film to build community? How can you use it to bring people together? And to be intentional about it. We can all pick up our smartphones today and make a film, right? So what is it that's going to be different about your film that accomplishes that engagement, that bringing people together, that really will make a difference? And um, we have a very activist group of students here on campus, so um, they embrace that message very much. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, let's uh, turn to Tamara. So Tamara, you're in the film. Uh, you're now an international film star yourself. And uh, so, so talk personally. I've been with you several times at the Gardens of the Queen. And you know, why, why is it so important to you? Why is it such a big part of your life? OK, I, I do spend a lot of time uh, of my life in water. But believe it, believe it or not, I cannot swim with all my things. So the first time that I put my head uh, on the water in the Garden of the Queen, I thought, I need to learn how to dive. <laughs> I have to do it. And it was hard, but I, I do it. And um, in one of my, my first dives in the Garden of the Queen, I was very, very nervous, um, but I have uh, uh, the opportunity to, to encounter a 400-pounder Goliath Cooper. It was, semi, it was really, really large, big, I'm, I'm so small. And that fish was, wow. And this was um, an incredible experience. One in a, in, a, in a time when you lose all the sense of, of time, of gravity, of, of everything was, was marvelous. So uh, that's a very, very special place. It's only uh, compared to be with the family at home. So that's why it's so special to me. Well, uh, Tamara works for a company called Avalon, which is an Italian company that's had a concession to operate the dive center and the fishing center. And so it's, it's an example of a private-public partnership. And Avalon has done a wonderful job of protecting and promoting the park. And so what are some of the problems, Tamara, that, that Avalon and you and your team are, are working on? What threats do you see facing the park? Um. Well, like, uh, like uh, in, any, in, in any place in the world right now, in every uh, marine reserve or national parks in the world, um, uh, we are facing the threat of the, of the overfishing and the people wanting to, to come to fish uh, uh, inside the, the protected areas. And that's natural. So right now, with the crisis, it's even, it, it's even harder for for communities to get food and, and, and fish anything a, a, anywhere else. So uh, we are working really, really hard to show uh, with, um, with research that that's fish inside the protected area right now is not a solution. So you, you could have food uh, one day, and then we, you will not have any fish for the future. And you will have no other uh, kind of income that, uh, like uh, we do when, when you do, uh, um, have an operation, a tourism operation, like, a, uh, like a, this uh, company has been doing uh, for more than 20 years now of flying fishing and, and, and scuba diving. And so this company, I used to be a researcher, and I used to work in a research center. And then I moved to this uh, company because uh, we think that this is a, a very important work, and they are like a supporting, uh, supporting all of the patrolling of the area. But uh, they are supporting not only the research uh, within the Garden of the Queen; they are supporting uh, marine research in other parts of, the, of Cuba and in other places when they also have operation. And that's uh, that's uh, uh, make a difference and, and provide uh, uh, room uh, for for scientists to get to go together. And have expeditions and 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 get data to to better inform to to our our, our government uh, about how to use the resources and and, and get better uh, uh, income for the for the country. 
And the, and the work that Tamara and her colleagues have done ha has informed the government policy. Uh, they've strengthened protections of the park. And if you look at the posters outside, um, the, the, the slogan is El Mar que nos une, the sea that unites us. And you know we share not only the splendor of the underwater world, but also the problems, as Tamara was talking about, overfishing, oil spills, plastic pollution. And so I'd like to turn to Julio uh, Mat, who works in Belize uh, with the Wildlife Conservation Society, a partner of the Environmental Defense Fund there. But Julio, you know, you live uh, next to one of the world's most spectacular reefs, the Mesoamerican Reef, but you also, uh, the reef also has serious challenges just like the reefs in Cuba. So can you talk about some of the challenges and how they're addressed on a local scale in Belize, but also El Mar de los Une, how we work at a regional scale? Good, good evening and thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Thank you guys for coming. Um, it's really a wonderful film. Um, what, what I liked about it was it, it made a very nice summary of, of a lot of the good work that goes to protect our reefs, reefs and our um, environmental and, and, and deal with so many environmental challenges. Um, in Belize, some of the problems being shown here or spoken about here are not unique. We face them, we've been working on them, we have issues of overfishing, uh, coastal development. Um, everybody wants to live near the sea and so they want to clear as much land uh, as possible so that they get these nice white beaches. We, we have those issues, we have issues of, of climate change. Um, uh, we have storms passing through the country affecting not only where us humans live but also the habitat for all of these species. And so what we have been doing in Belize um, is a similar collaboration as we are doing in Cuba with, with EDF uh, and communities um, to, to work together, together, not only to restore, but to start protecting some of the areas. Um, for instance, we've recently had an, an expansion of no take areas. Again, we, we want to ensure that we have enough um, sea spaces protected to allow for the recovery of some of these species. Um, we recently did uh, the protection of a two mile radius around the three um, atolls that we have for the protection of sharks. Again, just like in Cuba, sharks provide a very uh, important economic, um, um, economic uh, contribution to, to, the, to the tourism sector, to the coastal communities. And so it's very important that we look at some of these species from, from the uh, value that they, can, that they can provide by being alive, being in the water, <coughs> as opposed to being filleted and, and sent uh, across the world uh, for someone's dinner. Um, but yeah, uh, for us it's collaboration, uh, science, and engagement with the communities. Um, that, that's going to be key for us to be successful in, in, in protecting uh, such valuable uh, ecosystems. Yeah, so, so collaboration. So, uh, collaboration. So, Peachy mentioned that during the Obama years, we began to see much more exchange, much more collaboration, not only between environmental groups like ours, but between governments. And so for the first time in almost 60 years, the US and Cuban governments started talking to each other, started um, you know, making plans, started conducting joint research together. We have some friends from NOAA here who were part of that, who made that happen. And uh, but then things changed. And uh, so I want to turn to Phil Brenner, uh, who has, uh, been a Cuba, U.S. Cuba expert for, for a long, long time, is a professor here at American University, and is a staunch advocate for constructive engagement. So Phil, talk to us about, about uh, why collaboration is so important, particularly on the environment, but in general, and sort of where we're going with this. Well, first, thank you very much, uh, Dan, Valerie, for putting this together, School of Communication. It's an honor to be on the same stage with Mario Conde. <laughs> Be careful. Uh, is this not? Yeah, it's on. It's on? So, uh, I don't know if everyone in this audience is uh, knowledgeable about U.S. policy towards Cuba. So, let me tell you that uh, until uh, the Obama administration, uh, the, there was a lot of tension. Uh, and Cuba, uh, the United States has an embargo against Cuba. 
That embargo is based on a 1917 Trading with the Enemy Act. <coughs> Cuba is still considered an enemy of the United States. Uh, in uh, November of, of 2014, President Obama, in a speech, said that there's no reason to think that policies that were made in 1961 make any sense today. Uh, and it indicated that he wanted to change things. A month later, Presidents Castro and Obama announced that there would be a resumption of diplomatic relations between the two countries. And that in the next two years, the, uh, the United States and Cuba signed 22 memoranda of understanding. This provided the framework for engagement between the two countries. Uh, five of those 22 concerned the environment, uh, waterways, protection of the environment, there were others about tech, uh, anticipating disasters, disaster relief, uh, work on cancer together, uh, but five out of the 22 concerned the environment. Uh, and then the Trump administration came along and reversed the Obama policy. But he didn't get rid of the 22 memoranda of understanding. He simply didn't implement them. To implement them, you needed to have meetings. And the Trump administration refused to allow US officials to meet with Cuban officials to discuss all of these issues. Uh, so the Biden administration has simply followed suit on the Trump administration. Uh, a week ago, uh, the former Deputy National Security Advisor for uh, President Obama uh, said that it was unconscionable that the United States continues to maintain Alice policy, because that policy has led to uh, sickness in Cuba, it's led to the in inability for Cubans to, in fact, protect the environment. Uh, there are now discussions between Cuba and the United States over migration. The Biden administration cares about migration, uh, but nothing else. Uh, and what we understand, then, is that the collaboration over the environment uh, there's been collaboration still with organizations like EDF. That's been very important, uh, but not government-to-government -government collaboration. And it needs government-to-government -government collaboration. I want to emphasize that this collaboration is not a gift to Cuba. This is in the U.S. interest. This is in the interest of the United States, as well as Cuba. But that shouldn't deter <coughs> the United States from acting in its own self-interest collaborate with Cuba. The, Cuba is close enough that the waters in Cuba affect the waters in the United States, the, the reefs in the United States, as well as the rest of the world. And it's Cuba's great uh, achievement that they maintain this and are committed to this. And the United States, which doesn't think can learn from anyone else, can learn from Cuba. And that's what collaboration would allow us to do. Bill, thank you for that last. Uh, that last point. After Hurricane Katrina in 2005, I was part of the delegation that brought Cubans to New Orleans to talk about how to better prepare for storms. And Cuba does a phenomenal job of, of getting people out of harm's way during hurricanes. We have so much to learn from Cuba on coral reefs, on mangroves, and on climate change. And so thank you for making that, that point. And, and the group in Cuba doing probably the most impressive work is the largest uh, environmental conservation group that Yosiel Marrero is part of. And, um, and Yosiel is also sort of this, this uh, renaissance guy. He, you know, he's an engineer, but he's also like a music promoter, he's an artist promoter, he's an environmental advocate. And uh, so he is our connection with Peachy. And, um, and so Yosiel, talk a little bit about the Environmental Film Festival, the Isla Verde Festival, and why you're excited about it. And, and what do you see coming out of it? Uh, Dan, thank you. Thank you, everybody, uh, to be here. We have to thank that some parents bring some kids. I saw some kids. We have to, to thank those uh, fathers that bring their kids. And for me, to uh, be here is very important before talk about the environmental film, because it's a moment to, to be thinking about our, um, of a lot of things. That, I'm an engineer, you know, I see everything like systems. 
That corner there, it's a corner of my friends and the friends of my friends. And for me, I'm very proud that they're my friends from different generations. It's René, Ernesto, Milay, Jordan, and friends, Jesus Puerto. But all those friends of mine, they have different opinions, economical, social, political, ideological opinions. And they're friends together now because I was the connection. And I'm trying to reproduce what nature do. And there, this corner is doing, it's sitting there with Gonzalo from NOAA, it's American, it's an American agency, and it's sitting with the Cuban official from the embassy. And there, they are my two friends, Gretchen and Harold, there. And what really we have to convince in ourselves that be sitting, let's try to talk in this point, environment and conservation of nature, that is the point where it look like we all agree on that. And just sitting and talking about that, we will be ready in ourselves how to sit and talk people with different opinion and with <coughs> different point of view. And after that, we'll be uh, teaching both governments that we have to find where is the negotiation table to talk and negotiate and talk different things. But environment, now the festival, it's a, a, a way to be learning how that we have to reproduce the same capacity that nature has to put together different species with different behavior, but all they live in the same uh, environment, in the same ecosystem. And the festival is a way to uh, try to create a, a pilot uh, area uh, where the festival is just a week, but we will try to be working all the, the year and all the years in the next 20, 10, 30. <laughs> <laughs> we will be alive in the United States. Spanish. <laughs> and we hope that it will be good. Just the festival will be like a motive, uh, you know, a criteria to develop all sustainable energy process, a, um, sustainable business development, new economies, you know, all the, the, the new economies, uh, color economy, blue economy, is very important for the island. You know, the really, what really is those economies, no? Brown economy, green economy, and just try to revert the tourist industry, but the really sustainable tourist industry, and a lot of other industry. And it's what the festival what we are trying now. Find a, a, a you know, small island that has been for different uh, year um, potential in agriculture, in other kind of industry, and with, with the festival we'll try to be like here. Uh, people, opinion, habitats, ecosystems, uh, that we are different, we can talk. And we can be sitting, uh, talking of, uh, about different points, even when we have different opinion of a lot of other points. So that's great, Garcia. So I said before, Elmar Kenosune, the sea that unites us, I shouldn't have said Yosiel Kenosune. <laughs> Yossi all brings us together, thank you very much. Uh, change, change. <laughs> <laughs> a new poster contest. So that, that, that's a perfect setup for Maria Jose, who is the executive director of Center for of the Democracy in the Americas. And so, Maria, can you talk to the uh, Congress and the administration, talk to the Cuban government? I mean, we know why we need to do it. <clears throat> you know, why, why aren't we doing it? And what can we do to, to start working together, to come together? even despite our differences. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I think um, this is the boring part of the, the conversation here, but um, we are living in a really complex time for U.S. Your relations. And the positive thing is that we saw some movement from the U.S. government in May, and so positive announcements to uh, restore some areas of engagement with Cuba. 
um, including the, the restoring of the Cuban family reunification parole, uh, some areas of remittances, some areas of, of travel, and, and really to try and support the private sector. <coughs> Uh, just this week, we also saw an announcement of the rest restoration of uh, immigrant visa processing in Havana, which has been a, a, a real problem for, for Cubans to come to the U.S., and I think we all here, many of you here suffer from that uh, to, to be here today. And so that is uh, happening uh, very soon in, in, in January, and that's also very positive. However, um, more needs to be done, and it really needs to be done immediately. The situation in Cuba, it's, uh, it's really dire. Cuba is going through a lot of uh, domestic challenges, including the humanitarian <coughs> crisis on the ground, economic crisis, the, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also the government response to the July 11 protests with repression and censorship of independent media and the U.S. is for the contributing to the situation on the ground with uh, the implementation of the sanctions that uh, disproportionately affect the Cuban people and are really blanket sanctions that were established many, many years ago. Um, I had the opportunity this week to uh, um, talk to other Cuban partners and colleagues and members of Cuban civil society, entrepreneurs, members of the independent media, and to learn a little bit more about the situation on the ground since we haven't traveled there for a while, and also to share uh, uh, a room yesterday and really good conversations with this group here. And uh, something was really striking to me is that Cuba is really changing. Um, um, the private sector, for example, is really uh, growing. There are new measures, there are new companies, um, and US policy is just outdated. And it's not really supporting the Cuban people or supporting the private sector, and that was really clear from, from those conversations. So we are expecting the administration to make more announcements in the coming months, hopefully. Likely after November, we know the Cuba policy is really uh, a political football. Uh, and we're expecting announcements, um, or we're hoping the administration to remove Cuba, for example, from the list of state sponsors of terrorism, which affects the private sector, affects the people that are trying to travel to the US. We're hoping to see more measures to support the private sector, to support uh, with remittances, and we're hoping to see more measures on travel. It is unclear when that is going to happen. Uh, we are going to keep pushing for that, but I think beyond uh, what we're, we're talking today, beyond the specific sanctions and restriction, I think the only way really to move forward is with a real policy of bilateral collaboration and engagement on issues and dialogue, on issues that are go beyond migration. As Phil mentioned here, um, the, the bilateral migration talks are already happening, and that's a very good first step of taking into account that more than 200,000 Cuban migrants and asylum seekers have uh, reached the U.S.-Mexico border in the past year. Um, and, and more than 6,000 Cuban migrants are coming to the U.S. by sea. So it's a real crisis, and, and we're hoping to see more collaboration. And I think it's also important to say that here in the U.S. also uh, advocates are fighting uh, battles that they thought long won on uh, many issues like gender equality, racial disparities, LGBTQI rights, immigrant rights. And in Cuba, there is an increased participation uh, of civil society. And I think it is clear that both uh, uh, the people of Cuba and the people of the US can learn from each other and, and, and also share best practices with each other. And that uh, I think would be important. In terms of you know what we should see from, from the Cuban government and really focusing on the relation with the US, I think Cuba has been really eager to receive scientific collaboration, and this is an example to receive uh, and to have environmental co cooperation. CDA has witnessed that through delegations that we have led to, to Cuba, uh, focus on the environment, on sustainability. We also brought Sylvia Earle to Cuba uh, and, uh, and other uh, ocean elders. And so that is happening, but I think the, as I mentioned, the domestic challenges on the ground are affecting every aspect of Cuba's reality and are getting in the way of uh, more engagement with the U.S. 
I would say there are a couple of things that could be done on, on the human side. For example, addressing the, uh, the sentences of those that were uh, in prison after the July 11 protests, including minors. I think also maintaining and supporting the expansion of the private sector and how that could create more opportunities, removing barriers for entrepreneurs and others. Uh, participation in international forums, regional cooperation forums that are uh, taking place around the environment and other issues. I think it's really important also to uh, really uh, achieve this conversation and get to, to the table with the U.S. because at the end of the day, that's what's going to keep us talking and that's when I, uh, it will create the change that we're seeing and, and the possibility for Cubans to stay the opportunity for Cubans to stay and also the opportunity to build bridges, uh, which is something that we're seeing again here. And it's really important not only for the environment. Phil said it, um, we have 22 bilateral agreements in place and we should be using those agreements because we know what dialogue means, we know the results of dialogue and that's something that you cannot uh, uh, erase. So I think we, we need to keep pushing for that. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, there's so much there. Um, we are almost finished. Uh, I encourage everyone to stick around and uh, talk to Mingle, talk to everyone. I want to put Adan on the spot. He, he didn't know I was going to talk to him, but but uh, but Maria uh, talked about the the, uh, the private sector policies, the emerging private sector entrepreneurs. And Adon is an incredible entrepreneur. I want to go work for him. And so, uh, uh, seriously. Uh, and so, Adon, can you just give us some words on, on why you're hopeful with, with uh, you know, the changes taking place that, that allow you to grow your businesses and, and uh, you and your, your young friends? Let's, let's have people talk with him outside. Let's go. <laughs> He's a young guy. I'll talk about one. Uh, well, uh, it has been a game changing for uh, private business in Cuba. Since last year, they opened for first time the enterprise. I, I will be able to, I am able to make an enterprise uh, since the 59s, the beginning of the revolution. It's the first time that uh, companies are now able to be open. So that is game changing, the ability to grow, uh, to create work. Uh, to create jobs uh, and to develop in different areas that, that were before uh, a year ago they were all prohibited. Right now they are allowing me to do whatever I want uh, in business and uh, there are other forms like uh, social projects that I have one that is a kind of a foundation that is another way that you can have a structure. I, I used to, I have been running a gallery and an art project uh, since seven years ago, and I didn't have any legal status as a project, and I have been doing more than, I have made more than 50 exhibitions. I have made a lot of workshops for the community that I'm in, and right now, for the first time, I have a legal uh, structure that I can apply for research in other places that I was not able before. And I think that is completely game changing the opportunity that we have right now with technology. There are a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things, uh, creating different companies, creating different, uh, developing in different areas that, uh, long, that have been long for a long time, only managed by the state. And I think that is working a lot better in all this area that we are in. No? So I think the 